everyone. Um, thanks for joining us um, for the Vegpreneur Summit um, and this session around uh, plant-based snacks. Um, I'm Daniel Carsovar, CEO of Plant-Based Solutions, um, consulting company. We help businesses develop, launch, and scale uh, CPG products in the plant-based space um, and launched a uh, online learning platform um, last uh, last year that we're going to be relaunching again um, in the you know coming coming year. So excited to be here and uh, have some wonderful people uh, with us. Let everyone introduce themselves. Um, but we've got uh, Akua, Courtney, um, and Corey uh, from Impact Snacks. Um, thanks for joining. Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah thanks so much. Yeah. So maybe we start with a little uh, Courtney. Start with you and just you know. What do you do? What's your company about? Uh, how'd you get into this? Yeah, I'm Courtney Boyd Myers, um, CEO and CMO, co-founder of Akua. Uh, I started Akua working on it at least three years ago, and I became obsessed with this idea that we can create food that is just as healthy for me and you as it is for the planet too. And we do plant-based products made from ocean farmed kelp. So growing uh, this beautiful brown macroalgae uh, off the coast of Maine in these regenerative farms that don't require fresh water or dry land to grow. Uh, and this is our first product that we launched last year, kelp jerky. Amazing. More regenerative farming. That's that's definitely the future. Uh, so congrats on on that on that launch. Um, and Corey, Thanks. same. Yeah, yeah. So that's a definitely a tough act to follow. I've been following you for, for a little while now. But um, yeah, my name is Corey Nobly. I'm the founder and CEO of Impact Snacks. Um, and, and yeah, I've been working on this actually for about four years since high school. Um, what started out as a, uh, an attempt to make sustainable nutrition slowly evolved into something that's uh, kind of sustainable across the board. Sustainable supply chains kind of became my passion, my co-founder's passion. Um, and now we have what we believe to be one of the most sustainable snacks in the world. Uh, we have you know home compostable edible uh, packaging that looks, feels, and functions like plastic. Uh, even the ink is made out of vegetables. We have ethically sourced plant-based ingredients and a 250% carbon negative supply chain. So we're really excited. Just closed our Kickstarter and happy to be here. Wow, congrats. So interesting, both of you are really focused on sustainability as a key kind of you know anchor of your, your product, your company. Um, so maybe Courtney, what led you in this direction? Um, you know, kind of how did you get started in this? Do you have a background in food or product development? I wish I did because starting a food company is really hard. <laughs> um, I, I mean, but but maybe it was better that I didn't and kind of going in blind with just all the passion for, you know, creating the change that I wanted to see in the world. So my, um, my dad was in snacks and food. He's an amazing guy, but, um, you know, was in Burger King and Pepsi and Frito-Lay. And I just watched his health, you know, deteriorate over the years and it, it, it was horrible. And so I got, I get really, really angry when I turn over the packaging and I see ingredients that are snuck in there into the food that many people are feeding their children. Um, so my, my sort of journey really started at, at, at health. And then I realized that the food we were creating was causing, you know, even worse health for our planet. And then I was like, this is so, so broken. And, and food is such a big part of, of our, you know, our, our environmental system. So if I was going to start a company, it had to be something that addressed both those things. Um, so that's, yeah, that's where my journey started. Uh, that's amazing. I mean, so many people have gotten into the plant-based space for, you know, a myriad of reasons, um, be it, you know, health, animal welfare, healing the planet. Um, and the more we see, you know, new entrepreneurs coming onto the scene, uh, it just, you know, keeps feeding the system, which, you know, at the end of the day, a plant-based economy is really kind of our future in terms of, uh, you know, healing people and the planet, uh, doing it, you know, with, um, uh, you know, a lot of kind of ethically minded, you know, business, um, that whole idea of regenerative, you know, uh, farming. Um, Corey, you mentioned even like the carbon neutral approach. So what studies, I mean, you're pretty young in, in this, you know, industry. Uh, you know, how, how did you go about launching uh, a new product? Yeah, so I mean, what started off in high school was uh, it was very small scale. It was, it was more me just making things. You know, it was made to order all in my kitchen, uh, friends and family. Uh, and after a few high school business competitions, and you know, going to college with my co-founder, 
um, that's when we really wanted to kind of quote take it to the next level, uh, <laughs> as they say, um, and that is yet to happen. But um, mm -hmm. we spent like a long time, uh, over a year, just just researching what we really wanted to be, um, and because because we knew we had this you know a really really sustainable nutritional solution. We never used any uh, you know more than five ingredients, um, but. You know what really you know we really started to notice the impact we were having so whether it be thousands of pbfy plastic mailers just stacking up or um just not knowing really where a lot of our products came from or how they you know how they were sourced or any of that um and and, and we had no idea how any of that works either like we we had no knowledge in the industry um when it came to plastic we have no background in chemical engineering nothing um so we're still learning but it, it we really it just started this long learning process and um, and it was really one step at a time. There was no one shift, but you know, mm -hmm. it's plastic first, and then and then the type of ingredients, and then how they're sourced, and then well, now that we know our footprint, like what are we going to do to offset it? And, um, and yeah, you know, we had we probably had like five or six different products, and um, this is the first time we've really taken it um, large scale, and you know, produced fifty two thousand units. We just put in an order for a hundred thousand more, and people are really liking this. But it's been it's been a really really slow evolution, but. Wow, it's fantastic. I mean, this is the, you know, as I mentioned, you know, there's been a, a focus of entrepreneurship over the last, you know, I don't know, 10 years, um, a bigger, um, a bigger focus than in the past. And I would say in the last five years, it's, you know, more of a focus on, um, you know, that kind of conscious capitalism and, you know, entrepreneurship um, that really benefits all. So great, great to see that you're, that you're doing it. So I'd be remiss not to mention, you um, COVID and how this, you know, has affected everyone. So I'd love to hear a little bit of, you know, um, what happened to you? How did you pivot? You know, how's it, you know, going moving forward? Um, do you feel like we're through this, you know, yet? Uh, so Courtney, maybe start with you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, in, in March, I was, um, a consulting with an events company, like while running on Kua full time, I was, um, helping, a run basically the ocean programming for this event that was going to go on in May. And so I'm watching this, this company's revenues go from $60 million to zero overnight. Meanwhile, our company, like we started doubling in revenue because like all of these like crazy people that were hoarding food decided that they needed kelp jerky and they were just coming to our <laughs> website and buying anything that they could buy online. And, you know, for us, it was, it was almost a good thing in the beginning. You know, we, we, you know, our, the cost to acquire a customer on, on Facebook and Instagram dropped, you know, below 10 bucks. So we welcomed a lot of new customers during that, that early time period. We were certainly not unscathed. I mean, we started fundraising in February. So our fundraise was has been brutal during this mm -hmm. process. And then I think the last thing is um, we've really suffered from social distancing rules that have been implemented in our production facility and had to build a separate production facility so that, you know, we could, we could adhere to those guidelines and still keep up production. And then the last thing is just, which I'm sure everybody's realizing, whether it's, you know, your Amazon.com or your Akua is like shipping and, and selling things and, and getting them to places on time and including getting your ingredients on time has just been, you know, a total mess. Mm. And, and has the, you know, you mentioned more and more people were, you know, purchasing through your website. So do you see that as a pivot from a, you know, kind of a go to market strategy and putting more focus towards digital marketing? And, you know, what's your approach to, to that? I mean, thank God we've always been like almost 100% e-commerce as a company. You know, mm -hmm. we went out to, uh, we, we, we drove out to Anaheim when Expo got canceled and that at, at that oh, yeah. point in our business, we were like, we're going to, you know, go big into retail. We bought a table and, you know, we kind of imagined someone from Kroger coming over and, you know, doing this big launch. And then, you know, when it got canceled, we just thought, oh my God, you know, how fast can we get up on Amazon? And, and we launched it uh, on amazon.com within four weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, we were lucky that we already had built like all of the full stack marketing around our e-com. Um, mm -hmm. We've since now gone into more retail in the fall. So I don't, Corey, I'd love to hear if you're in retail or online, but our retail dropped, the retail we did had, it dropped during COVID. And sure. I totally get it. You know, grocery store managers are not concerned about stocking kelp jerky when they need to keep like pasta, wine and paper towels on the shelf. So we, but, but in around kind of mid August, early September, our retail has, has really came back, which is great. That's great. That's fantastic. 
Um, yeah, Corey, same with you. You know, you just uh, you're kind of a new launch. So what was it like over the last, you know, six months dealing with, you know, with COVID? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's, it's, it was a little unfortunate because we closed our, our seed round in February and we were slated to launch at the end of February. And, um, you know, no, we're not money, money in, Corey, you're good. <laughs> yeah. you know, we're not unique in this case, though, but we like only had expenses, right, um, for a few months because we had to push the launch um, for, for a number of reasons. But, um, you know, as we pushed it, to, we pushed it to August 26th on Kickstarter. Um, we we kind of noticed that, it, you know, there, there, there was a, a silver lining in that like so many industries got like kind of this forward pull in growth from COVID. So you have e-commerce, right? Um, mm -hmm. just, just a general interest in sustainability, uh, plant-based consumption. Um, and, and I do think that anyone that's at like the intersection of consumer goods and sustainability stands to benefit from this shift in, in, in consumer behavior that, that we're seeing as a result of the pandemic. So um, I, I think if anything, it's only strengthened our relationship with our customers and the people we work with, but um, it was definitely the, the it was definitely expensive um, to delay the launch, but we've kind of pivoted. You know, um, similar to Courtney, we we were kind of expecting like you know we're going to go retail. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have these beautiful shippers that were all you know designed and um, and we've kind of said yeah no we're just going to go full Amazon and uh, our own ecom site. So um, we're going to be doing some stuff through Amazon Launchpad over the next few months, but just doubling down on our own e-commerce site for now and. And I do. I would encourage any company right now to pursue reward crowdfunding, um, you know, on Indiegogo or Kickstarter, because um, not only is it like a mission-driven platform, but um, just the world of crowdfunding is taking off. And mm. we would probably not have been able to get the level of pre-orders that we got on Kickstarter on our own e-com site. Um, and it really helped kind of offset a lot of the losses associated with the delay from 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 launching uh, so late. But but yeah, there's there's been some good, some bad overwhelmingly uh, positive though. Um, oh, that's, net it out that way. Yeah. That's great. Um, just to stay on this topic because it's, been, it's so timely right now relating to e-commerce. Um, you mentioned that, you know, in addition to Amazon that you've, you know, put some focus on your website as well. And, you know, we've heard a lot of kind of pros and cons and some people just put 100% of their, you know, focus on e-commerce to Amazon since there's so much traffic. But in doing so, you know, obviously there's a cost related. Um, there's there's high traffic, but um, there's sometimes a you know a disconnect from the consumer, right? Owning the email address, being able to really um, you know start to build and you know build a, a community um, that cares maybe more deeply about your product and what you're about. So uh, I'm just curious, what steps have you taken, if any, to try to drive more traffic to your own website? Um, to push e-commerce, maybe through a you know a third-party uh, shipper, um, if at all, Courtney. Um, you know, I guess for us, like we we actually brought our our three PL, like our shipping, to my co-founder's house during COVID because we had it in Tribeca, and the company just became like they all left. And when your shipping company leaves New York, <laughs> it's a really bad time. So, well, we were really lucky about a week before COVID, we had made the decision to move everything to my co-founder's house and hire his his dad and his sister to run our, our shipping because um, they give us a really good deal. And, uh, you know, in terms of pushing traffic to our website, I mean, we've just kind of traditional performance marketing, you know, Facebook, Instagram. Um, we don't push as much traffic to Amazon. And I think this is, something that, you know, you'll learn Corey with Launchpad. It, it, the Amazon's just, it's its tough to make a lot of money until you're really at volumes. They take, you know, quite a bit of cash from, from every um, sale. I mean, there's some retail channels that are better for us than Amazon. The Amazon's a huge audience though, so you can scale quickly, but we've really, really focused the the heat of the, um, the traffic on our own website. We haven't done a lot of PR. I think PR is really hard right now for food companies. Like, mm -hmm. you know, unless, you're, you know, do talking about the politics or COVID or Black Lives Matter? Like, there's just a, a lot of bigger stories that the journalists are focused on. Um, and then I think growing organically on Instagram for us, I mean, you know, we haven't been, we have maybe 14,000 followers. It hasn't been like crazy growth. Um, and I'd love to see more. I think 
you know, working with influencers is, is something that's, that helps us a lot. Um, but a lot of that's just been organic because we don't have the budget to pay people. So we just yeah. send them free, free snacks for smiles. <laughs> yeah. Something to keep in mind. Uh, we have a digital marketing team and, you know, run some campaigns for uh, plant-based companies um, is the platforms have really broadened um, for food. So believe it or not, um, there's a lot of people, um, a lot of, you know, positive impact for companies um, on things even like Pinterest, um, TikTok now, uh, you'll start to see more and more food companies on there. Um, just, you know, again, more ways to get the, you know, get the word out where, um, you know, Instagram is still a fantastic platform for that. But definitely, you know, keeping those campaigns going that drives traffic to your website, you know, for, for purchases, uh, owning that email, you know, communicating, believe it or not, you know, email still the number one uh, way to, you know, connect to people. Um, and especially with such a, you know, interesting, um, uh, you know, interesting products that you, that you both have uh, with a focus on, uh, you know, nutrition and, you know, regenerative farming and all of that, you're just going to get so much interest, um, even without a PR story, just, you know, uh, the story that you have already. Um, yeah. So just to pivot a little bit, um, you know, you both launched, but I'm sure you're, you know, still aware of, you know, the comp set um, in snacking. And I'm just, you know, curious and for everyone who's watching, maybe touch on, you know, what you've seen um, in trends in snacking and, you know, how does that affect, you know, your product development or your plans for, you know, future launches? Corey, do you want to start with that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so some trends that we've seen are, you know, we've actually taken a, a different approach to kind of observing trends and uh, recording them than, than using like Statista or any of these, uh, you know, traditional uh, data providers. Um, what we've been doing is we've just been scouring the web for the comment sections under under uh, what we believe to be some of the strongest brands on the internet. So, um, like what's called like comment culture, something that one of my friends pointed out to me, he was on a college campus and um, started talking about it. like, yeah, like most of consumer demands that I see brands acting on are, are based on what people are talking about in the YouTube comment section, Instagram comment section. Um, and and it, it's, it's pretty eye opening. So um, for example, like the shift, you know, just, just even asking companies, like, why do you use so much plastic? Um, and then the brand's being forced to, to react and then, and then make some positive changes. Um, a lot of that for, for some pretty prominent brands have actually started on their own social media in those comment sections. So, uh, I mean, that's just like one, one piece of how we're doing it, but yeah, we're seeing um, adaptogens are, you know, this isn't, this isn't new, but in terms of ingredients, like adaptogens, things for mind, body, and gut, instead of just focusing on, you know, biceps with like high protein uh, supplements, right? Um, we're seeing a, a really, really big focus on uh, transparent supply chains. Um, you know, more and more consumers are people like DMing us, direct messaging us, not just the company, but the founders saying like, hey, can you shed any light on, you know, where this is sourced from or uh, what's this made out of? Um, so um, I, I, I guess there's, you know, the, the, the ingredients, there's, there's the desire to have sustainable materials, but uh, I think just all in all, it's just, it's just people want to build a relationship with the people behind the brand, right? And, and I think it's really like personal brands are, are showing through and you have to be able to talk to uh, all your customers and address their needs one by one and identify patterns and then make shifts in your company's practices based on all of that. Um, and so far it's been, most of our growth has been coming from that kind of practice. So, Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, over time that kind of feedback often leads to, you know, expanded fact pages on your website, um, you know, or videos or, you know, more in-depth uh, you know, storytelling for brands is what we're seeing and, you know, kind of promoting and helping to facilitate because that's what people are looking for. And then you can share that both on your website, on YouTube, you know, stories that get, you know, put out on blog posts and you start to, you know, gather more of those people that have those same, you know, shared interests. So that, that's great. Uh, Courtney, for you, same question, just in terms of what trends have you seen and how does that affect you? Um, I can't get this sort of thought out of my mind right now, which is like when Corey, I, I just learned really about your company and I went to your website and like the passion that you put into like every layer of your product, like the ingredients, the packaging, the, I, for me, there's something like I'm 35. I'm guessing you're, you said you're four years out of high school. So they're four years out of college. So you're a little yeah. younger than me. I'm going to guess. Uh, I'm 20, <laughs> and, yeah. And this, um, you're how old? 20. Yeah, like this, um, I have the, the 
really the honor of working with a 24 year old and a 20 year old and this generation coming up, which a couple of my friends call like the indigo kids, like the, the commitment to like this better future is just so authentic. And it, it makes kind of the older generations who, who've like created a lot of these problems around, you know, just like crappy ingredients, you know, crappy agricultural practices, crappy, uh, in, you know, sort of wrappings and, and how we send things. Um, it gives me so much hope. So when you say like what trends do I pay attention to, I, I try to pay as much attention to people who are your age, who are committed to these causes, because I, I just feel like there's so much authenticity and truth. And I'm, I'm just it's so awesome to see what you're doing. Like I, I know how hard it is on the packaging thing for, for starters and like to just be doing that, like right out of the gate. Um, I think that's something that's really like reflective of that generation. You know, I think some people in our generation even are like, well, I'll get going and then I'll switch to compostable. Right. And you're just like, no, like from day one, I'm doing everything right. Cause like, why would you do anything differently? Um, so I find that really, really inspiring. It's just everyone that's younger that I talk to about our business just gets it like that. Meanwhile, like older people are like, sorry, not to be like ages, but like people I talk to are like, I don't really think there's a market for regenerative aquaculture. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, so I just, I, yeah, I, I get so inspired by this generation coming up right now and, and, and their commitment to just like doing everything right. Even if you know, it's harder and more expensive and, and all the things that are slowing business down. Um, but it's the right way to do business, and that's the important thing. Yeah, I think, um, and, and, and sorry, then we can we can move on. But one, I, I appreciate the, the kind words about my generation. Uh, it's a breath of fresh air after all, like that whole Tide Pod eating that that went on uh, about a year ago. But um, I, I think I, I think a lot of people think that oh, it might just be like oh, it's just Gen Z that, that, that cares about this. I, I don't I don't I don't necessarily think that's true. Um, I just think that Gen Z and, and younger generations are the ones that dominate social media, right? So uh, whenever you go online and you see this overwhelming like wave of people advocating for change, it's it's naturally going to the younger people just because they have more devices in their hands, right? I think every generation has people that care, but just access to information has kind of allowed people to uh, to kind of like voice these concerns in a way that like we haven't really seen before. Um, and and I and I think that's it's it's a really really powerful thing, um, and kind of this transition to the circular economy is going to be enabled largely just by increased access to information. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Courtney, you bring up a good point because for a, a new company, you know, we do a lot of work with, um, you know, third party, you know, co-packers and manufacturing and, you know, supply chain. So when you have smaller volumes, that's even more challenging to go outside of, you know, the norm. Um, you know, as you know, higher volume, sure, you get a little more flexibility to do different things. So to see us, you know, a startup, um, but we are seeing more of that with companies, this idea around, you know, brand integrity, you know, really creating a core, you know, ethos for the company of, you know, of why they exist. Um, and it's kind of, you know, you know, often with startups, you know, it's kind of a brand work, you know, session that, you know, will facilitate. But so much of that is, you know, it's great that you've got an idea for, food and a food company, but, you know, why are you existing? You know, do people really need your next, you know, snack? But if you really believe in change and, you know, healing the planet and, you know, uh, thinking through these things, you know, as Corey has, you know, then you have a stronger foundation, I think, to start a company, um, you know, a better story to tell, when, you know, both to retailers, to consumers, and when you're raising capital, you know, that you uh, stand out from the crowd. So I think, those things are important for any company that's thinking about starting up is really understanding why you exist, you know, and why there should be another food company, you know, that you're behind. Um, what difference are you going to make really, you know, what problem are you solving? Um, and again, when you have those answers, you use them to sell into stores, you use them to sell to consumers, you use them to sell to, you know, potentially to, um, you know, investors down the line. Um, so it's great to hear that that's such a focus. Um, so just to kind of stick on what you guys are doing, um, just wanted to find out, you know, I know it's all new sometimes, um, but as you're planning the future, you know, what's some of the most, you know, exciting things you're working on right now, or, you know, planning to, you know, either potentially launch or to really look at in the industry right now. So Courtney, start with you. Yeah, well, we've been in market for a year and a half now with kelp jerky, and we've had a number of, you know, driving forces in, in terms of like our next product. 
So we secretly started selling our kelp burger all summer, um, which is frozen and ships overnight. So unfortunately, I cannot bring it to Germany for Roxy, who's who's live chatting, but I'm going to bring her jerky. Uh, but we've been s sending them out every week, getting consumer feedback, and it's just been amazing. Uh, and so we just launched with our first restaurant in L.A. last week. And yeah. we're gear gearing up for a public launch around the Kelp Burger on our website um, within the coming weeks. We just have the packaging, which is the last mile to really figure out. Um, so, yeah, definitely, you know, wow. giving people that kelp center of plate meat alternative, um, kind of moving from from snacks to center of plate is the thing that's most exciting at Akua. Exciting. Well, yeah. I'm in New York City, so you got to get me. Easy to send to you. <laughs> yeah, easy to send. To, easy to deliver to you. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go pick it up. Um, that's exciting. That's yeah. That that's really uh, interesting because you know often a company. Not to say that you have to, but you know again, just you know something to think about when it comes to also investors. You know, as a company, are you a product? You know, are you a brand that has multiple, you know, products and categories over time? You know, how are you thinking about building your business? Uh, we always recommend, you know, not to say that you can't just be, I mean, RX bar was just a bar, right? And they did quite okay just being that. Um, but as you're planning, um, you know, in thinking of how do you expand within a category, get more shelf space, you know, uh, maybe go into other um, contiguous categories that make sense. Uh, for for a brand, um, so that's exciting to see you know a core around your ingredient and how that could play into multiple categories. Um, so Corey, how about for you? What, what what do you have exciting that you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. And I and I'm going to you dropped the secret link for the kelp burger. I'm going to <laughs> right after this. That's really exciting. I, side note, my, my co-founder and I have tested like every single plant-based burger we can get our hands on. Um, oh, nice. that's cool. We're kind of ranking them. We kind of we might make some content around that. But anyways, um, yeah. So so we're really really excited about our bars. But honestly, um, and we've kind of kept this under wraps. Uh, but we're just our own case study. We're we're just our own. Um, you know, it's it's really just phase one of what we really want to do. Um, we think that or we thought that if, to make a product truly sustainable, truly circular. Um, it, it, it's quite difficult. And if you could do that to a fast moving consumer good, which is naturally a volume play, naturally has low margins, um, and it's single use, then we could do it to any product. Um, and and we wanted to, to, to test that at scale. Um, so we did, but really what we're building on the back end is kind of, imagine like a circle, uh, you can just plug in any product. And at the end, it spits out a version of that product that looks the same, maintains its margin structure, but is actually carbon negative. Um, and we think that we can do that to a whole host of companies right now. We're pilot testing it with five to 10 companies, um, all, all in the food and beverage category. But that, that, that is really our true north, being um, basically the service provider in this transition to, the, to circularity. Um, so it kind of evolved over time. We were, we were going to, we wanted to build like a family of, um, circular brands, uh, starting with snacks, moving center of plate, but we, we really just realized how many wonderful brands that are out there that are doing amazing things, but just need a little bit more help and in that transition to more, whether it be sustainable materials, understanding what even is your carbon footprint, how are you gonna reclaim it? Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's really just pivot after pivot evolved to this point, and we really think that we can help be a part of that change. So excited about that. It's it's going to be, it's a SaaS product, double SaaS, software as a service, but also, I guess, sustainability as a service. And um, we do it for a couple of orders of magnitude less than the average sustainability uh, consultant. So, um, and we are stealth launching this, which is a little ironic because we're on a panel. <laughs> people are watching, but. Well, that's exciting for a lot of companies that are, you know, on here um, because that has been an area, I have to say, you know, even in the consulting space that's been, um, you know, just kind of opaque, really, you know, uh, a lot of unknown around it or, you know, especially when working with third party, you know, manufacturers and packaging and, you know, it would be great to get it to a point where every time you're making a business decision, you understand the impact of carbon footprint. So, uh, you know, setting that up as a SaaS, you know, product, um, very exciting. Um, great, great and interesting innovation in the space. Um, so another thing for looking at some of these questions for people that are watching, uh, just in terms of, you know, advice, you know, there's so many panels and, um, you know, in the snacking space, you know, for entrepreneurs that are looking in this space, what advice might you have for them uh, about, you know, based on either your path, um, you know, or what they should be looking at, you know, now 
um, with so much on e-commerce perhaps as, as an area, but just in general, you know, what advice might you have for uh, entrepreneurs starting out in this space? Whoever wants to take that first. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd love to start with, um, well, one, I could, I could give you all the basic stuff, like, you know, try, try to start, you know, with sustainability at the core. But I think um, if, you, if you just want to launch a snack and, and launch it successfully, um, I, I really think that you need to focus on your own publisher uh, almost. So um, you're going to have, I mean, what's more crowded than the food and beverage industry, right? Uh, not much. Um, and, and you, you know, it's obvious, but you're going to want to stand out. Um, but I think what a lot of companies have been doing is um, more or less the same. It's been very cookie cutter. Um, but I think if, if you really start understanding, you know, at your core, what are you, why are you different and how can I turn that into content that mirrors our differentiators? I think that you're going to win. So just as an example, what we did, um, we realized that people really wanted to see uh, kind of like the behind the scenes of what was going on in supply chains. So uh, instead of, you know, just paying a bunch of TikTok influencers, we hired a TikTok influencer, a creator, um, and now he runs our, our you know, all of our content. Um, and he makes all this sort of, you know, organic content around, um, you know, transparency and supply chains, all, all that good stuff. Um, and it's gotten us like hundreds of thousands of impressions in just a few weeks. Uh, and, that, and that's directly translated to ROI. So I think that, you know, it's not enough to just have like a beautiful Facebook ad, right? Or, or like, a you know, any sort of great landing page. I think you really need to, be making content that no one else can be posting because it's very, very unique to your DNA. Um, mm. and, and yeah, it's the digital age, you gotta stand out. And, and that would definitely be my first piece of advice there. Yeah, Mine's right. gonna be a totally different spectrum because wow. I came into the you know food space as a journalist. So content, I f it felt a little bit easier. But my advice would be to like align yourself with someone who knows how to make your product at scale as early as possible <laughs> because like the further you get down like the business roadmap and you haven't figured out that like manufacturing at scale problem it's just it's it's one of the biggest headaches in the business and even if you have a simple product like a bar or let's say a ball which seems simple balls are one of the hardest products to make, you need a ball machine. Um, and it might be out in Ohio and it's during COVID. So do you fly to Ohio to meet with people, you know? And so, um, yeah, that would be my, my advice is like, you know, really making sure you've nailed the, the manufacturing partnership side as, as early as you can. Cause once that's flying, everything else means you can run in the business. Yeah, that's that's a, a big area. I've been working with co-packers uh, across the country for about five years, helping companies <laughs> scale. And, you know, often it's one of those things where they're, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're wearing all the hats and you're used to doing everything. And I get them to a point where the second you know that you can make, you know, scaled productions, you know, of growth over time uh, is the day you can pivot as an entrepreneur and start focusing on selling product. And you know, growing, growing revenue, which really is you know the valuation of your company, um, and you can do that you know in a myriad of ways. But it's the idea of getting someone out of the kitchen, out of the test kitchen, out of making it themselves, unless you know there's a need to make it yourself or build your own space because someone's not doing it. But if you make something that others can manufacture, um, there is a stepping stone process of you know finding that right co-packer partner, you know making sure that standards are there, the certifications are there, um, the packaging perhaps is there um, that, that's required and uh, putting it in their hands so that you can then focus on really growing your business. Um, we all get into a comfort space, especially with entrepreneurs that you know love food. So many of them just want to stay hands on on the production side. And at the end of the day, any big company, you know, it's getting made and it's your job to you know sell it and get it into more hands. Um, so yeah. interesting on 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 both sides, um, you know the innovation. Too bad, too bad, Corey, that Gen Z guy just ghosted us. Yeah, what happened? He's I don't gone. know. He's still not hanging out with us anymore. Yeah, he's on. He's oh, on here TikTok. he is. <laughs> yeah, he had to get on. He had to get on TikTok. Hey, Corey. I don't know if you can hear us, but um, just you know, we're, we're going to leave some time at the end of this. Hey, show. Hi, hi. That's okay. Sorry, my, my Wi-Fi just like tanked and it just muted, went all black. And then I heard I ghosted you and I was just trying to like log back in and 
So sorry about that. I don't know no, what's up my connection today. So. No worries. Um, we're gonna, I was gonna say, we're gonna leave some time at the end for, um, for Q and A. Um, you know, we we're just talking a little bit about, um, you know, what advice you have for, for others. You know, one of the big questions um, when startups are, you know, coming to plant-based solutions in terms of, you know, blank slate ideas, you know, what to do. Um, one of the first kind of exercises we take them through is really, is this what you want to do? Um, and almost challenge all their assumptions. And is this really the best, you know, uh, career path for you to be a founder of a food company? Um, because there's so many stumbling blocks that um, that entrepreneurs kind of didn't know about or what kind of cash flows required to grow. I mean, I've seen so many successful companies that are doing you know, 2 million in revenue, three, four years later, they don't have enormous growth, you know, 10%, 20% growth just doesn't do it anymore um, in terms of really, um, you know, in the snack space. I mean, I've seen a, a few of these companies just go out of business because they can't raise capital on, you know, 10, 20% year over growth. They're doing two, 3 million, but they can't take that next step. Um, and I want to always point out, you know, we, we love to be optimistic, but we also want to be really, you know, honest with people about this industry and kind of what's involved, their time, energy. So I guess this is a way to put the question back to both of you of what did you wish you knew prior to going into this business and launching a product that you kind of wish you had known or that some entrepreneur had told you, you know, get ready for this. This is what's going to impact your, you know, your life, your business um, that could, you know, either make it easy for you or, uh, you know, have a different perspective on what you're doing. This whole, because I've been through the fundraising during a pandemic hell, um, this whole question of like, oh, well, you're not growing fast enough, so we're not going to invest in you. It's kind of annoying because you're like, well, I, I'm the reason I'm fundraising is so I can grow faster. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. anyway, the um, the you know I think to that point, and and there's so many things I wish people had told me. But when you have an idea and you have an amazing team and charisma, and you're 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 running in that early stage, um, you know I think you should probably try to raise as well. There's obviously you can bootstrap your business and and grow it, and that's an amazing story. But if you are going the VC route, I would say to try to raise as much money as early as possible as as you can because you can get caught in these weird funky tranches unless like like fundraising is just so about like timing and and like an, there's such an art to it and so if you can raise as much money as possible and and build that team and scale quickly it's going to always mean that fundraising is earlier but if you like we tried to be really scrappy which meant that we've we've bootstrapped so much of this and our growth has been you know very organic and then when we try to raise money to grow they're like well you're not growing as fast as all these other companies that had a million dollars in the bank and you're getting compared to those so i guess my my advice is is to if you are going the vc route to 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 try to get as much money as you can before you have sales and because once you have sales numbers, if they're not as good as what an investor wants, they're always going to poke at that and kind of use it as an excuse not to put more money in. Um, and that's just, you know, kind of where where we're at as a company. So it might, might be a little jaded, mm -hmm. but like I, I hear that a lot from different founders. It's just raise as much as you can as early on as you can. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point because we do work with helping companies raise capital and, you know, put pitch decks together and work with, you know, a lot of mission driven investors out in Anaheim last year uh, or, you know, in March um, for Expo doing our big uh, plant based uh, investor summit, which we turned into an online summit once, uh, you know, everything got canceled. Um, and often companies are really hesitant. And, you know, there's a lot of psychology around obviously around money people's comfort with money the idea of raising money uh, and they often want to raise not enough money um, and when we show them you know um, a p l forecast and say well you know in four months you know or in six months you're going to need to raise again you don't want to be constantly in the raising money business because yeah. so many founders are doing that they're just you know on the cycle like on the tour um, and that's all they're doing you know raise more early and then you know have a plan to work with it is one um and don't be so concerned about you know what you're giving up or you know if you're doing it in convertible notes you know there's ways to do it you know like you said maybe through a few tranches 
um, where a 20% discount turns into a 15% discount, turns into a 10% discount as you de-risk the you know future investment, get a good investor who's willing to put more money in if you can show that you can do those sales. Um, but yeah, raising capital is definitely a challenge for a lot of people. Snacking category has been a little challenging, so I'm really excited to hear that the Indiegogo and these platforms are working well um, because a lot of a lot of uh, investment money has gone into the kind of meat analog uh, part of plant-based, um, where snacks aren't always as sexy of a product um, for a lot of investors. But I think there's still plenty of space in there. Um, so Corey, how about you? What advice, you know, do you wish you just, had? Just on that note, Presence Marketing just put out a study and they said plant-based snacks are growing 40% year over year right now compared to just the healthy snacking category. Um, yeah, I was added it to our deck, you know? No, nice, <laughs> nice. That's great, great stats. And if you look at like frequency of consumption too, which is really important, especially if you're trying to be sustainable, like the average American has four snacks a day. So like it's... It's, it's growing really, really quickly. Um, and that number's been growing, which sounds nuts, right? Because that's more than breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, it's everything in between. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so so I, you know, fortunately, we were able to to raise, you know, traditional, again, we raised from an institutional investor, a few angels. Oh, I froze. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, we raised our seed round in February, um, but then we also did some, some uh, reward crowdfunding in August. Um, and 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 I think you know Courtney's absolutely right. Um, I, I, I everything she said she said is spot on. One thing that I do think is is pretty important though is to. I, I think a lot of founders get really caught up in the whole fundraising route, and it's like it, it, they, sometimes I see them celebrating that more than their own, um, you know, revenue goals and and everything else, and it, it, it kind of makes this like. Uh, I, I think it's a pretty damaging picture of of what it means to have a successful company today. Um, because you know, I think it can get pretty toxic at times. I mean, you're just you're 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 growing not because of why you started the business. You're growing to hit these external goals that have been pushed onto you, um, which isn't a bad thing. You know, you know, VCs play a very very critical role. Uh, you know, in today's world, and we need them. But there needs to be like a balance that's struck with like mm -hmm. your own goals, your natural, you know, uh, you know, rate of growth and trajectory, and and, and that of everyone that is investing in you. Um, so I, I would explore all these different methods. I mean, you know, once you have cash flows, you don't need to to, to give up equity. You don't need to sell equity to, to grow. You can do royalty capital. There's, you know, there's Funnel Dash, there's ClearBank. There's this, I think it's what, 40 to 60%, I think of all VC dollars and consumer goods go to Google or Facebook. All <laughs> of that can be financed with royalty capital, all of that. Um, so if you start kind of breaking down which like, core functions of your business can be financed with debt in which you need to sell equity for. Um, that's what we did. And we found that we we're able to, to keep a lot more internal for our, our employees. Now we can offer employee or offer our employees far more favorable, um, you know, packages. And it, it just made growth a lot, a lot better um, and a lot more manageable. Um, and so, yeah, so that's one thing. And then, and then the second thing I'd, I'd recommend is I, I think that the part of like the founder's curse or even like the employees, early employees curse is you want to do so much early on uh, and you want to go retail and you want to go Amazon, you want to go D to C um, and then you have all this other stuff you want to do. And um, that's really expensive. And I think that's why, you know, people keep raising and raising and raising and raising to do all these things, but we live under power laws. You know, if you do, if you have 10 different initiatives, chances are one or two of them, are the only ones that are really going to, you know, produce these these kind of outsized uh, returns, and and the rest of them are, are probably maybe not even going to break even. So, um, kind of one step at a time. Um, really, uh, before you even scale a product market fit, just keep iterating that to make it even stronger and stronger. Um, I think I think it's really important. So, apologies if that's all over the place, but no, uh, it's, uh, the trap that we fell into was definitely trying to do too much at once and yeah. really honing in on your one, two, maybe three things, raise right. that, scale them naturally. Figure out what you need to raise debt for. Figure out what you need to sell equity for. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great point. I mean, uh, creating a uh, a comprehensive or a very focused go-to-market strategy um, is a big part of kind of the business development side of you know what we help companies with. Um, and right now, it's a you know if you have a product that can be sold you know direct you know to consumer e-commerce um, that's especially if it's light shelf stable. Um, easy to ship. Um, we've been pushing back uh, with some companies, again, maybe related to cash flow, um, you know, that they don't have to raise as much money and spend a year at a better sales margin, you know, selling online. 
uh, instead of doing all those efforts um, to go into retail and you know wholesale distributor, all the discounting that goes into it uh, so early on. Doesn't mean you shouldn't, but it depends on the case. So I think- And you'll have more leverage. And you have more leverage as well, because you you know get more excited. So uh, there's not I a lot of time left. I know we wanted to do some Q and A. Oh, Noah's on. Hey, Noah. How are you? I hate Good. to interrupt. Unfortunately, we don't have time for Q&A at this moment. However, if you three are around to join the social lounge um, for a bit sure. and maybe you can make your rounds at the table and people can ask their great questions to you directly, that would be great. Noah, thanks for keeping a tight ship and having us on. It's been great. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Corey, we'll talk Thank soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much. See you guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, Corey. Pleasure. Thank you. All right.